Good afternoon, Dr. Norton here with some Huck Finn lectures. Huck Finn written by a man named Samuel Clemens, who wrote under the pseudonym Mark Twain. In 1935, Ernest Hemingway wrote the following statement about Mark Twain and about Huck Finn. He says this, All modern American literature comes from one book by Mark Twain called Huckleberry Finn. American writing comes from that. There was nothing before. There has been nothing as good since. As a powerful statement from a very outspoken writer like Ernest Hemingway, in great praise of a text that I, I believe is deserving of great praise. So Mark Twain, born in November of 1835. He died in April of 1910. He married a woman in uh, February of 1870 named Olivia Langdon. They had four children together. Mark Twain served in the Confederate Army during the Civil War. He was a second lieutenant. He worked as a writer, a typesetter, an editor. For part of his life, uh, this period of time between 1857 and 1860, he worked on the Mississippi River as a riverboat pilot. Part of the time as a riverboat pilot apprentice, part of the time as a riverboat pilot. After that, he moved out west and began, really began his writing career. Mark Twain is understood as a, as a writer of the realist movement. He wrote realism. And we've done some, some work on realism so far. Here's some key characteristics that I think run, it, run closely in, in this text, Huckleberry Finn. Uh, characteristics of realism. It renders reality closely and in comprehensive detail. So reality is, is rendered closely. We, we try to mimic reality as much as possible in realism. There is a selective presentation of reality with an emphasis on verisimilitude. Verisimilitude, by definition, is the faithful representation of reality. The faithful representation of reality. Character is more important than action and plot in a realistic, in realism. Characters appear in their real complexity of temperament and motive. And class. Class is rendered as an important thing. Cl class is rendered uh, in a very realistic way. What, what are the implications of class and class structures? The novel has traditionally served the interests and aspirations of an insurgent middle class. Uh, Ian Watt, in his text, The Rise of the Novel, writes this statement. Class is important. The novel has traditionally served the interests and aspirations of an insurgent middle class. In realism, events will usually be of a plausible nature. So let's jump in. This text starts in a beautiful way. Chapter 1. You don't know about me without you have read a book by the name of The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, but that ain't no matter. That book was made by Mr. Mark Twain, and he told the truth mainly. There was things which he stretched, but mainly he told the truth. That is nothing. I never seen anybody but lied one time or another. Without it was Aunt Polly or the widow or maybe Mary. All right, so here right off the bat, we have this idea of, of reality rendered closely. We're trying to, trying to mimic reality as much as possible, even his very tone. Let's start with his dialectic, uh, his, the tone of his voice. What does his dialect sound like? You don't know about me without you have read. So we have an accent that's being mimicked here. A uh, southern, southern accent in some ways being mimicked, uh, being, being uh, described here. We call this a dialectical type of writing or dialectical writing. Mark Twain is, is really the king. Uh, he's known for his dialectical writing. The ability to mimic one's dialect. And if you've ever never tried this before in your own writing, to write in a way that mimics a dialect, it's very difficult. And once you've tried it, perhaps you'll discover the mastery of Mark Twain. Um, and throughout this text, there are several different dialects that he will mimic. So here we have, um, again, a certain, a certain type of, of voice and tone that is written in, in this, in this uh, opening paragraph. And then this idea that he's even writing about himself. He's telling a story and saying, you don't know about me unless you've read this other text. And most of that text is true. And so here, even writing about the nature of truth, um, casting some doubt on, on the uh, 
the literary text itself. Can we trust what we read? Sometimes in realism we see this, we see the written word called into question. Can we trust the, the written word? That's a very modern question, a very modern idea of, of challenging the written word. On the next page over, says this, the widow, the widow, she cried over me and called me a poor lost lamb. And she called me a lot of other names too, but she never meant no harm by it. She put me in them new clothes again, and I couldn't do nothing but sweat and sweat and feel all crammed up. Well then, the old thing commenced again. The widow rung a bell for supper, and you had to come to time. When you got to the table, you couldn't go right to eating, but you had to wait for the widow to tuck down her head and grumble a little over the victuals. Though there weren't really anything the matter with them, that is, nothing, only everything was cooked by itself. In a barrel of odds and ends, it is different. Things get mixed up, and the juice kind of swamps around, and the things go better. All right, right off the bat, Huck claims no literary authority. There is a simple, unadorned telling of actual events. One incident to the next is described. It's kept very simple. No embellishments or elaborate commentary. Very few subordinate clauses, if you think about it. Even the text, the sentences themselves are very simple. Again, that kind of goes back to the idea of the dialectic. Writing in the dialect of this young boy, of this boy, Huck Finn. Shelley Fisher Fishkin out of the University of Texas, she writes an interesting um, interesting essay about Huck Finn. She calls the text an epistemological funhouse. What does that mean? Epistemology obviously is, is, is the discussion of what is knowledge, how is knowledge acquired. And so one of the things in this text is this question, how is knowledge acquired? I mean, one of the, one of the things that we see here is this question. Um, There was things that he stretched, but mainly he told the truth. I never seen anybody but lied one time or another. This notion of Huck Finn asking questions, I mentioned before, of, of the written word, calling into question what is being transmuted, what is being uh, transferred through the written word. How is knowledge acquired? Is knowledge acquired through books? But what if we can't trust the book itself? And so that's one of the questions the text asks. As, a, as, as Shelley Fisher Fishkin says, the text is an epistemological funhouse. We don't know whose voice to trust. The text itself questions itself. Well, here, here's the beginning is, right? Huck Finn is saying, oh, Mark Twain, sometimes he lies. <laughs> like anybody else. So if everybody lies, then who can you trust? Thus the question. The epistemological funhouse. To what extent is it possible for a given subject to be known? To what extent can we know anything? How do we know what we know? The novel is a meditation on how illusions and ordinary life get intertwined in ordinary life as well as in narrative fiction. The novel is a meditation of how illusions and ordinary life get intertwined in ordinary life. So, so illusions, mythology, what, what, what place does mythology have in ordinary life? And where do we see these things inter intersect? I don't know if you've ever had a conversation with someone who believe strongly that uh, if you go out in the rain, you're going to catch a cold. Well, uh, I suppose people have caught colds by going out in the rain before. Um, but in many ways, we would call that a modern myth. I think one of the, uh, the colloquialisms we might, might say there is that's a wives' tale. No offense to wives, but that's just a colloquialism, right? It's a common kind of phrase, a, a slang expression, a wives' tale. And so we have these floating around in, in in our contemporary society, and uh, they've always kind of floated around different societies. That is a myth interposing or being connected, inter intertwining itself with real everyday life. And so a, a wives' tale or a myth interposing or coming into normal everyday life. Uh, how many of those do you have in your life? Do you right now, are you questioning the fact that my mom always told me, I've always believed that going out in the rain would give me a cold. Uh, perhaps you are right now in angst over that. Please don't worry. Um, not a good idea to walk out in the rain anyway, but will it give you a cold? Don't know. So, in what way, how do illusions get mixed up or intertwined in ordinary life? Shelley Fishkin uh, continues in this way. She, I just quote her directly here. Some t something new happened in Huck Finn that had never happened in American literature before. 
It was a book, as many critics have observed, that served as a declaration of independence from the genteel English novel tradition. Huckleberry Finn allowed a, a different kind of writing to happen. A clean, crisp, no-nonsense, earthy vernacular kind of writing that jumped off the printed page with unprecedented immediacy and energy. It was a book that talked. Huck's voice, combined with Twain's satiric genius, changed the shape of fiction in America. And African-American voices had a great deal to do with making it what it was. You know, right off the bat here, I think it's interesting to at least hit this topic. Um, Ralph Ellison, uh, well-known African-American writer, um, he makes this comment about nigger, the term nigger in the text, which is obviously disturbing on many levels. But in a 1991 interview, Ralph Ellison, uh, he was author of The Invisible Man or Invisible Man, I'm sure you're probably familiar with that one, he suggested that critics who condemn Twain for the portrait of Jim that we get in the book, forget that one also has to look at the teller of the tale and realize that you are getting a black man, an adult, seen through the condescending eyes, partially, of a young white boy. In the interview, the interviewer says, Are you asking, I asked Ellison, that those critics are making the same old mistake of confusing the narrator with the author? That they're saying that Twain saw him that way, rather than that Huck did. Yes, was Ellison's answer. And so Ralph Ellison goes on in this, in this article, in this interview, to explain the importance of voice, to, the, to explain the importance uh, of we as reader, to see a difference between author and narrator. The narrator in the text is a young boy with prejudices, a young boy who is, is covered and mired in, in the culture itself. And it's important for us to recognize that. And, and you know, obviously, the term nigger is, is wildly offensive. But this boy is wildly offensive in many ways. And how do you communicate how offensive this boy is other than to give his real voice, to then to allow him to speak uncensored? If you take that away, you take away part of this character. You take away part of this narrator. So as much as I dislike the term itself, I see the importance of it in the text. Ralph Ellison is responding in some ways, uh, in part at least, to uh, many who would condemn the use of this term in the text, and yet he is saying for the, for the, the, the proper portrayal of this character narrator, Huck Finn, the term must be used. Another uh, key term not, not used in the text itself, but this idea that floats around the text um, is is the is the idea of the noble savage? So, kind of just right off the bat here, we're looking at um, a young boy, Huck Finn, as our narrator, a narrator that um, you cannot trust. Please do not trust our narrator. He's an unreliable narrator. But many things have been said about our narrator. Some have called him uh, a noble savage. Here some some thoughts I wrote down here. Um, Rousseau believed that man was good when in the state of nature the state of all other animals, and the condition humankind was in before the creation of civilization and society. Man was good when in the state of nature, but he is corrupted by society. This idea has often led to the attribution to Rousseau, the idea of the noble savage, an expression that was first used by a man named John Dryden uh, in 1672 in a text called The Conquest of Grenada. Rousseau, however, never used the expression himself, and, and it does not ac adequately render his idea of the natural goodness of humanity. Nonetheless, this idea of the noble savage, a term coined by John Dryden, is this, is this notion that, that before he enters society, man is, is at his best as a noble savage. He's at his best before he enters society. But then as he enters and lives in society, he is corrupted. That things are put on him. Prejudices, views of the world around him, views of race, um, and, so, and, and views of women, perhaps, are, are, are foisted upon him, or are put upon him. And he is thereby corrupted from his noble, savage condition. Is that what Huck Finn is? In some ways, we might see 
Huck Finn as in, an inverted noble savage. He begins as a boy that's been corrupted in some ways, and as he travels down the Mississippi River, he begins to shed his clothing, literally, but does he also shed his prejudices? It's a good question to be asking her early on in the text. Um, one of the first things that I just read here about um, the widow crying over him, calling him a poor lost lamb, the widow ringing a bell for supper, making him wear these clothes that were so itchy and uncomfortable, even cooking the food uh, all separately, not allowing things to be mixed. This speaks to a theme right at the beginning of the text, uh, a theme of freedom, but then also a tension, we might say, between freedom and captivity. Uh, a tension between civilized versus savage. What is truly civilized? One of the questions I think a text asks is, is it truly civilized to, to believe that an African-American man is less than, less intelligent naturally, less valuable than a white man? Is that a civilized view? In some ways, the text calls that into question in a very controversial way and makes us, in some ways, see the most civilized view of an African-American, uh, the most civilized way of viewing an African-American man or woman is to see them as equal, to see all men and women, no matter what their race or color, to see them all, see all men and women as equal, equally valuable. Right. On page 10, this is uh, chapter 2. Chapter 2, Twain writes, Everybody was willing. So Tom got out a sheet of paper that he had wrote the oath on and read it. It swore every boy to stick to the band and never tell any of the secrets. And if anybody done anything to any boy in the, in the band, whichever boy was ordered to kill that person and his family must do it. And he mustn't eat and he mustn't sleep till he had killed them and hacked a cross in their breasts, which was the sign of the band. And nobody that didn't belong to the band could use that mark. And if he did, he must be sued. And if he'd done it again, he must be killed. And if anybody that belonged to the band told the secrets, he must have his throat cut, and then have his carcass burnt up and the ashes scattered all around, and his name blotted off the list with blood and never mentioned again by the gang, but have a curse put on it, and be forgot forever. Everybody said it was real beautiful oath, and asked Tom if he got it out of his own head. He said some of it, but the rest was out of pirate books and robber books, and every gang that was high-toned had it. Interesting comment there. Every gang that was high-toned. Okay, so there's a couple things that are key here. We have a term, synecdoche. Synecdoche. S-Y-N-E-C-D-O-C-H-E. -E. Synecdoche. A uh, definition of synecdoche is when a part is used to describe the whole. It's a figure of speech in which a part is used for the whole. Um, an example, as uh, a deckhand, you might say you've heard the term deckhand or just a hand will be considered a sailor, right? That's a hand, the whole man. How can... So the hand is a part that is used to describe the whole, okay? Uh, another one is a cutthroat for an assassin. Uh, a thief can be described as a pickpocket. Uh, steel can be another term used to describe a sword. All right. So, so how here? And we're looking at synecdoche with this robber band, right? The, the, the band of robbers, the band of, uh, of robbers that Tom Sawyer, Tom Sawyer's gang is made up of. In some ways, we have this here, this Tom Sawyer gang as synecdoche for all of society. In some ways, Twain is using this band of robbers to describe society as a whole. What other things throughout the text, what other um, elements is, is Twain using to describe all of humanity? What other parts of humanity, is he, whatever parts is he using to describe the whole? You know, something else we see in this beginning passage I think is, is great as well is this idea of text as authority. Now, I mentioned before, the very beginning, the first statements of the, of the book itself call into question the, the, the truth or the reliability of the written word, a very modern uh, thing to do. 
But here it was that Tom Sawyer, here it is that Tom Sawyer is saying, our authority is what? Our authority is pirate books and robber books and every gang that was high-toned. They would respect robber books and pirate books. So right there, again, although Tom Sawyer seems to be a rebel in some ways, is creating his own authority, his own voice of authority. Um, he is, uh, in some ways, seeing an authoritative voice in pirate books and robber books, right back to the written word, the written text. And so, although Tom Sawyer seems to be an independent, free-thinking young man, is he in reality such a thing? Is he a free-thinking young man? Or is he just one more picture of, of society that is a slave to, oppressed by the written word? Not free-thinking, not independent. No. Page 19, I'll jump over here. This is in chapter 3. More about the text here. The, the, the idea of what is the text in, in, in this novel. How is the text? What is text? And how does it play a part in our lives, in society? And does it play a proper role in our lives and in our society? Can we question the role of the text? I think as critical thinkers, part of what I think we see Mark Twain doing in this, in this work is calling into question the authoritative voices that we accept in our lives. Do we accept them without, without thinking critically about them? You turn the TV on to Fox News or CNN and just listen uncritically to everything that is spoken. Or, or do you recognize the fact that, that even those news programs on TV or the newspaper itself, the LA Times or the Register or the Wall Street Journal, that those texts are also seeking to influence for their own means, for their own benefit? Who's funding that project and why? These are key questions to be asking, and, and really that's part of what is being set before you in this text is, is the question, who are these authoritative voices and why do they have authority? Should they be an authoritative source or an authoritative voice in your life, in my life? Well, on page 19 here. Why? They rub an old tin lamp or an iron ring and then the genies come tearing in with the thunder and lightning are ripping around and the smoke were rolling and everything they all are, they're told to do, they up and they do it. They don't think nothing of pulling a shot tower up by the roots and belting a Sunday school superintendent over the head with it or any other man. Who makes them tear around so? Why, whoever rubs the lamp or the ring. They belong to whoever rubs the lamp or the ring, and they've got to do whatever he says. If he tells them to build a palace 40 miles long out of diamonds and fill it with full of chewing gum or whatever you want and fetch an emperor's daughter from China for you to marry, they've got to do it. And they've got to do it before sunup next morning too. And more, they've got to waltz and palace around over the country wherever you want it. You understand? Well, says I, it's Huck Finn, right? I think they're a pack of flatheads for not keeping the palace themselves instead of fooling them away like that. And, and what's more, if I was one of them, I would see a man in Jericho before I would drop my business and come to him for the rubbing of an old tin lamp. How you talk, Huck Finn? This is Tom Sawyer responding. Why... You'd have to come when he rubbed it, whether you wanted to or not. Huck Finn. What? An eye as high as a tree and as big as a church? All right, then. I would come. But I'd lay I'd make that man climb the highest tree there was in the country. Shucks. It ain't no use to talk to you, Huck Finn. You don't seem to know anything. Somehow. Perfect saphead. That's Tom Sawyer, right? Criticizing Huck Finn. Why? Because Huck Finn is rejecting the textual authority. Huck Finn is rejecting textual authorities, or a key textual authority that, that Tom Sawyer recognizes. Where do we see this in society? Again, this is a picture, a part of the whole. A part is being representing, a part is representing the whole here. The relationship that Tom and Huck have is a representation of reality. Where do you see that? Where do you see people in your life that would say, what? You don't believe this unquestioningly? Something's wrong with you. We see this all the time. Huck Finn says, I thought all this over for two or three days. And then I, would, I reckoned I would see if there was anything in it. I got an old tin lamp. 
and an iron ring, and went out into the woods and rubbed and rubbed till I sweat like an engine, calculating to build a palace and sell it. But it warned no use. None of the genies come. So then I judged that all that stuff was only just one of Tom Sawyer's lies. So what do we have here? What is he doing here? Well, basically, this is a very primitive, kind of simplified version of the scientific method, right? Testing by experimentation. Huck Finn tests the theory by experimentation and rules and judges it false. Judges Tom Sawyer a liar for, for expounding upon these, these theories without proper evidence. So I judged all this stuff was only just one of Tom Sawyer's lies. I reckoned he believed in the Arabs and the elephants. But as for me, I think different. I had all the marks. It had all, it had all the marks of a Sunday school. Again, that's fascinating because, again, we have this idea of Huck's rationality versus Tom's fictional world. Tom's, sorry, Huck's rationality, Huck's realism versus Tom's romanticism. That's going to be a key tension. And the representation of, of realism in the text is Huck Finn. The representation of romanticism in the text, Tom Sawyer. A little further into this section on page 46. This is chapter 7. It says this. Well, last I pulled out some of my hair and blooded the axe good and stuck it on the back side and slung the axe in the corner. Then I took up the pig and held him to my breast with my jacket so he couldn't drip till I got a good piece below the house and then dumped him into the river. This is the section where Tom is, is escaping from the imprisonment he was in um, by his father. His dad kidnaps him um, and takes him out of the woods and, and locks him in a cabin, right? And here is his escape as he's making this great plan. Now I thought of something else. So I went and got the bag of meal and my old saw out of the canoe and fetched them to the house. I took the bag to where it used to stand and ripped a hole in the bottom of it with the saw, for there weren't no knives and forks on the place. Papped on everything with his clasped knife about the cooking. Then I carried the sack about a hundred yards across the grass and through the willows east of the house to a shallow lake that was five mile wide and full of rushes, and ducks too, you might say, in the season. There was a slough or a creek leading out of it on the other side that went miles away. I don't know where, but it didn't go to the river. The meal sifted out and made a little track all the way to the lake. I dropped Pap's whetstone there too, so as to look like it had been done by accident. Then I tip, then I tied up the, the rip in the meal sack with a string so it wouldn't leak no more, and took it and my saw to the canoe again. Now, Huck Finn, how does he know how to do all this? This is natural learning for him. Huck Finn is another one of those examples of natural learning, and this comes in tension or in conflict with book learning. As, as, as in the same way that Huck Finn is uh, representation or representative of, of realism, of scientific method, he is also a representation of natural learning. On the flip side of this, book learning, right? Natural learning versus book learning. These are the two things that separate Huck Finn from Tom Sawyer and, and perhaps many of the other characters in the text. I will right, we'll take a little break. <laughs>